It's interesting to me that they come in and they so heavily are pushed, uh, with their university of Michigan amateur careers. You know, they're, they're wearing those jackets and they've got, um, a song that's similar to Michigan's fight song. And this feels like something Jim Ross would have really pushed for, but he wasn't even with the company at the time. Right. Well, Jim, Jim came in at WrestleMania nine. So Jim, as far as commentary, you know, he could push, he, he would go ahead and push that stuff. That wasn't necessarily a big direction as to, we want to promote their college deal, but they were Michigan guys. They had a Michigan accent. Why not? It was real. And they were a real damn tag team. I'll tell you that. Uh, the theme music, of course, we talked about Jim Johnson to start. What's the, what's the thinking behind the music that you guys put with them? Michigan theme song ripoff, Michigan band, you know, the, the football thing. Well, so I guess my question is if, if we're saying yeah. that wasn't really the push, but then that's the theme song and then inconsistent, not really. Okay. So they're coming out in their Michigan jackets and they've got Michigan, uh, fight songs, but we're not pushing Michigan. Cool. We're off to nah. a good start so far. Yeah. Um, Vince's vision, since it wasn't Michigan, you know, despite the music and the jackets, what was it? He wanted loud colored tights like they had worn in WCW and just keep doing what they were doing in WCW or what was Vince's vision for how he saw their characters? He saw these guys as youthful wrestling monsters, uh, that they were, he, he did like their amateur background and he liked, he liked the style that they worked in the ring, which took their amateur, um, credentials and just made them shine. But it was, they did it in a different way. You've kind of shared before on the show that sometimes you would watch the WCW pay per view with people from the office. Do you remember watching a Steiner Brothers match with Vince and him being impressed with them? And if so, do you remember who the opponents were? No, I don't ever remember watching, watching him with Vince. I remember watching with Howard and Pat all the time. Um, God, everybody they did, but they, they outshined everybody, you know, with the Frankensteiner, the Frankensteiner was something that only small guys did back in the day. It was a Lucha move that, you know, the small guys did. And here was Scott Steiner doing this and making it look better than other people had ever done. Yeah. I feel like we should mention here that a, a lot of people credit Scott Steiner as being the creator of the Frankensteiner and that he created the move. You know, of course, a lot of, uh, Lucha fans are going to say, no, that was just a hurricane Rana. It was around before. Do you remember the first time you saw the move? The, yeah. The first time I saw it was Gino Hernandez doing it like in 1979 or s something like that, which was, that was the first time I had seen it. And everybody was talking same thing like this. We all thought Gino had invented it and everybody's going, no, it's a Mexican high spot. Yeah. I mean, the, the deal is I believe it's even named after the guy who invented it. Um, I'm going to butcher it of course, cause I'm a redneck, but I believe it's Huracan Ramirez. So that's the reason it's called a uh, Huracan Rana, but it is still interesting to me that so many people, uh, Scott Steiner himself still say, Oh no, I, I, I invented that bro. Um, the first time that you see that though, on American TV, at least the first time I saw it on American TV is when Scott Steiner did it. And I think people sort of overlook what a big move that was. I mean, if you went to a WCW show, whether it was a television taping or a house show or whatever, if the Steiner brothers were on the card, that's what everybody wanted to see. That's the move that everybody wanted to see in a Steiner brothers match. Sure. That was the finish, man. That was the pop. And, and that was something that, and especially for a guy, the size of Scott Steiner to do it, man, that's impressive shit. Uh, no doubt. And, um, I was, a, I was a fan as a kid and I was excited for them to be here, uh, anywhere the Steiner brothers were, man, I was in, and, uh, they were in January 8th of 1993 in Philadelphia, their old NWA stomping grounds, getting a win over the executioners the next day in East Rutherford. And then the next day in Allentown. Uh, and then on January 11th, it's the very first raw from the Manhattan center. The Steiner brothers get a win over the executioners. Uh, this is a pretty generic name for a tag team. Who were the executioners? Do you remember? Jose Luis Rivera and Jose Estrada. How did you think their, uh, their television debut 
came, came together. I thought it was great. Absolutely great. Because the people in New York, man, it was, it was electric. They always liked when somebody that they knew a little bit from WCW or the old NWA would come in and debut and they like to see what we're going to do with them. And the fact that here were the Steiners as the Steiners, they knew them. We didn't change them. They were excited. It was a good, good debut. I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to get there for sure. Uh, of course you guys had a history of changing people's gimmicks. You know, Barry Windham comes in and he's the fucking stalker and Dustin Reynolds comes in and he's gold dust. How did the Steiner brothers come in? And they're the Steiner brothers. Probably laziness out of more than anything. Some, you know, I'll tell, I'll tell you exactly how that happens. Time runs out. Vince will, I think Vince, if he could change everybody's name, he would so that he can own it. And sometimes you'll talk about it and you'll talk about it and you'll talk about it to death. Time will run out. You'll be sitting there at a television tape and go, okay, we got to go. What are we going to go with? God damn it. Just go with whatever the hell their name is. And then it's on TV and you're good. (laughs) Ted DiBiase Jr. is a perfect example of that. We had three months, I shit you not, of he wanted a new name and a new gimmick for Ted DiBiase Jr. And we all wanted him to just be Ted DiBiase Jr. Nobody could come up with anything. So when it came time for him to debut, it was fuck it. He's Ted DiBiase Jr. (laughs) That's just amazing to me that so much of people's careers and what they're able to use afterwards and earn a living is just, ah, oh, we ran out of time. Fuck it. Yeah. It, but, it, but think about that too, is that you could take Kurt Hennig's kid and bring him in and Vince would probably say, God, he'd make a good Ted DiBiase jr. Wouldn't he? <laughs> well, we had Ted DiBiase jr. <laughs> who was a pretty good Ted DiBiase Jr. But you didn't like that. Um, yes, it, it can be. You can find the funny points in it sometimes. Are you are you saying that really happened? What? That Curtis Axel was maybe considered to be Ted DiBiase Jr.? That was a hypothetical. But it, that would have been fucking hilarious, by the way. You could, you could see. No, I'm saying I could see Vince going, I need a Dusty Jr. <laughs> Well, Dusty Dustin's available. No, no one would buy that. <laughs> God damn it. Find oh. me Dusty Jr. I want the puppies and a blotch. Put the splotch on the other side. Um Yeah, just weird shit like that sometimes when you uh well we have that. I don't want that one. <laughs> <laughs> so when you, why, when you guys are thinking about the first raw, the Steiner brother debut feels like something you guys would have really wanted to promote for that. Right? Absolutely. You know, this it's, it's a first man. It's the first time you're in New York, you're in the Manhattan center. We wanted to make a big splash. This was a live show. So we wanted to give it a feeling of, of special. And that was special to have the Steiners first time in the WWF on Monday night, raw live. We get to uh, Royal rumble 93, January 24th. That's going down in Sacramento. And we see the Steiners get a win over the Beverly brothers. Uh, any memories of that match or the Beverly brothers? I don't know when we'll talk about them again. Oh, the Beverly brothers are to me, an unsung heroes of tag tag team because they, um, Wayne bloom was like a power lifter. The skinny one, the tall, skinny one, right? He was a power lifter, an extremely strong guy and a tough guy. Mike Enos, one of the most easygoing, really nice guys you'd ever want to meet. I liked the hell out of both of them. They both came from Minnesota and they were part of that whole road warrior, Kurt Hennig, Rick rude group, tough as nails, uh, meaning both Kevin Walkaltz and nails, you know what I mean? But uh, really good guys, and they could they could go. I just felt that they were always almost in the in the right place at the wrong time, if you know what I mean. Yeah, because the, they always got overshadowed. Timing. Yes. Um, 
they start working. Do you remember the, the uh, Royal rumble match? You know, at this point they've had two really high profile matches for the company on the debut raw. And then at the rumble 93 at this point is Vince feeling pretty good about his investment. What was Vince's early feeling about their debuts? Uh, he, he loved them because they looked strong and they looked like monsters and they came out and we, you know, other than you had demolition, who's a big power team, but they didn't move like the Steiners. And here was a big power team that could move like cruiserweights. Of so course. he was happy with them. 